this is the brand new XL750 Transalp from Honda. It sits smack bang in the middle of the CB500X and its biggest sibling, the Africa Twin. But is it actually any good? Let's find out. Mm. I just wanted to interrupt this dude's hip thrusting to tell you about this week's sponsor, Kalimoto. Now I've been using Kalimoto for a few years and it's hands down the best navigation app for my motorbike. It's helped me find some incredible local roads for my bike reviews and better yet, you can use it absolutely free. So what are you waiting for? Download Kalimoto from the link below. I'll also put it in the description and give it a go for yourself. Back to the video. Okay, so before we get to going, I'll do a bit of a brief walk around. We have these slightly, I'm not gonna say different looks because I do think the light is a little bit bland. From the side, I think it looks quite nice, but yeah, the front light, I think they could have done something a bit bolder with that design. We have a 21 inch front wheel, spoked wheels. These are tubed tires, unfortunately. So the tires are Dunlop Trailmax Mixed Tour. We have Showa SFF cartridge forks, 200 mil travel. And uh, here is the beating heart of the machine. This is the 755cc parallel twin motor. Uh, it's got the Unicam design, which they first introduced on their race bred CRF 450. We have this gorgeous uh, matte iridium grey metallic colour. We have a ProLink monoshock at the rear. It's adjustable, but you do have to get your C-spanners out. No remote preload adjuster, unfortunately. 18-inch rear wheel. Again, tubed tyres, unfortunately, spoked. Uh, we have a 16.9 litre fuel tank. We have... A seat height of 850 millimetres, but you can buy a low seat if you are short of leg. We have what looks like the mounting points for a carrier, but it doesn't seem to come with the carrier. You've got these grab handles. But enough of that, we want to go ride it, don't we? So let's throw our leg over and see what she feels like under buttock. So as I said, 850 mil seat height. I'm not on tippy toes. But I can't flat foot it, so I'm 5'8 with a 30 inch inseam. Also, if you want to know about any of my gear, the cameras I'm using, what I'm wearing, check the links in the description. Thank you, Insta360, for sending me the X3. I've got an affiliate link, so do click that if you're interested in one of these awesome 360 cameras. Right, let's uh, fire up the dash. We've got this, I think it's a 5 inch TFT. Uh, same dash system as the Hornet, albeit this has got a few different modes and some different settings that the Hornet doesn't have. Because it's got a 270 degree crank, I think it sounds quite lovely. Essentially the same firing order as a V-twin. So before we get into the uh, more into the specs and the performance of the bike, the Transalp was a bike that Honda first introduced in 1986. And uh, it was a 583cc V-twin engine. And it was kind of designed as a do-it-all crossover machine. So people who wanted to do commuting, touring, and a little bit of sort of dirt road riding, that was a bike that they could do it on. And uh, they, I think the last one was 2008, which had gone up in capacity to 680 cc. And uh, yeah, there was no other Transalp since then. Until now, the last iteration of the Transalp back in 2008 weighed 214 kilograms. Not sure if that was the dry weight or the wet weight, but this is now 208 kilograms and that's wet. So that's with fuel, 90% fuel. Again, 16.9 litre fuel tank. We'll go into more of that stuff in a bit. So let's talk about that engine first of all, because this is the same engine that's in the Honda Hornet, which is a bike I currently have on long-term loan and I absolutely adore the performance of the bike. The engine is one of the stars of the show. And I'll be honest, it's no different on this bike. It is a really, really fun engine, especially when you get it revving and singing, and it does have a nice exhaust and induction note too. <laughs> it is a very playful engine that rewards you for being a little bit of a wally. So it's got 90.5 horsepower at 9,500 RPM and 75 Newton meters of torque, and that's at 7,250 RPM. It seems to redline at around about 10,000 RPM, which sounds quite high. And on paper, at least, you might be forgiven for thinking that all the power is made almost at the redline. But this bike is very, very torquey. Torque rich delivery of power, as you will see in a bit. I know on the Hornet people complain that uh, the Hornet is no longer a 
inline four and I've had so many comments go, oh, it's not an inline four, it's not a Hornet. So I'd be interested to see what people make of this being in a parallel twin and not a V-twin as the original Transat was. It doesn't seem on initial kind of research that people are that upset about this being a parallel twin. <laughs> So yeah, we'll see. Let me know in the comments what you think of the parallel twin version of this Transalp. So the suspension up front, 43mm Showa forks. Those are separate function fork cartridge version of those. And we've got 200mm travel at the front. And at the rear we've got a monoshock which uh, attaches to a Pro-Link swing arm, aluminium swing arm, just to help keep weights down. And at the rear we have 190mm travel. Ground clearance is set at 210 millimetres, which I think is pretty respectable. The overall bike weight is 208 kilograms, which is the lightest trans up they've ever made. The frame itself has got a steel, I think it's a steel diamond frame. The frame itself weighs 18.3 uh, kilos, which is actually 10% lighter than the frame of the 500X, which is rather impressive considering this has got quite a bit more power at 90.5 over 47 horses or ponies ergonomics then you feel bolt upright lovely wide handlebars the seat itself on first inspection feels pretty soft but after a little while i do find it a bit uncomfortable very similar to that on the cb500x actually um, the most amount of time in the saddle was about two two hours without getting off and i'll admit by the end of that i was ready to have a break knee position is not too bad i can't imagine my knees aching all that much on a longer journey <laughs> but the fun is that engine actually let's go down to third get it screaming ah my favorite bend ruined by a bloody delivery truck <laughs> These brakes are pretty good as well. So we'll talk about the brakes in a second, but just want to touch on that engine. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because the engine actually makes quite a lot of torque low down and makes it fairly easy to use. You don't need to get the bike screaming or revving that much, but it always surprises me or it continues to surprise me that how much it revs out. So it just keeps kind of pulling all the way up to that red line. It doesn't seem to kind of lose any, any oomph. The torque curve feels, to me at least, a lot smoother or a lot linear, a lot more linear on this than the Hornet. The Hornet seems to make a bit more pick up low down, which sends that wheel skywards. But this just seems to be a bit flatter and, and I quite like that, a more linear delivery of torque. Yeah, it does sound good. So let's talk about the brakes quickly then. I'm just gonna slam on the anchors here. Yeah, so the, I don't know if you saw that, but the dash lit up with the uh, hazard lights. So it's got the Honda kind of smart emergency braking system. Whereas if you, if you jam on the brakes, it will flash the hazards for you. But the brakes actually have a nice amount of power. Now they're only axial, they're two pot axial brakes at the front and they bite down onto two twin 310mm discs. Let's get some air. <laughs> yeah! That is fun. Yeah, twin 310mm discs. And at the rear, I think it's a 256mm disc with a single piston caliper. What's the rear like? Not bad. Plenty of feeling through the pedal. It's got the bear trap style pedal as well for off road shenanigans we have a couple of bikers good day sirs so yeah braking performance actually a lot more impressive than you would think on paper because you kind of see axial mounted brakes in, in twin pistons you think well that's not going to be very good but actually yeah they're not bad obviously you get a lot of weight transfer because you've got long legs on this bike 200 mil travel right we're on the motorway now or motorway style road we're at 70 miles an hour and we're doing just under 4,000 rpm close my visor properly. Uh, I'm getting a little bit of buffeting around the top of my lid. Now that might be better on a non-peaked helmet. And I've got a little bit of buttering on my... Uh, buttering? I've buttered myself up. <laughs> I've got buffering on my arms as well. 
So this is the standard screen in the top position. I believe you can change it, but you'd have to get the Allen keys out. Uh, you can get a touring screen as an option, um, but I'd like to try a spoiler on the standard screen. That might actually do, do an okay job. But it's a pretty comfortable place to be. I've done quite a few hundred miles on this bike over the last week, including a fair amount of motorway stuff. And uh, yeah, it's, it's not the quietest bike. There is a little bit of buffeting, as I've said, but performance wise, it's absolutely fine. Plenty of torque, and if you just roll on the throttle, you'll easily get to higher speeds. For motorway stuff, this is absolutely fine. A really decent bike for touring, I reckon. And you can, of course, get um, heated grips, you can get full crash protection upper and lower bars, you can get full luggage, either soft or hard luggage. Uh, no cruise control, unfortunately, that's not even an option, which is a shame. We can talk about fuel economy. I've been getting an average of 63 point, about 63 to 64 mpg. The last tank I did, about 180 miles, and I still had one bar left. I hadn't gone on to reserve, so I could easily assume, or reasonably assume, that you'd get over 200 miles from a tank without too much issue. And actually, that was uh, that 60 odd miles per gallon was with me riding it fairly aggressively to be honest the handling is very surprising especially considering it has a 21 inch front wheel i kind of i always expect bikes with that size wheel to handle a bit kind of vague and a little bit floaty at the front but um this bike is actually quite fun so the suspension is fairly firm which sort of helps the bike in the corners and feel quite sporty um I haven't taken it massively off-road, I've done a few gravel bits with it, but we'll do a bit more off-road today, just on a green lane, see how it copes. So the suspension, I'd say it does pretty much everything it intends to, so as a crossover bike it will offer a good amount of damping for touring, for motorway stuff, or probably for dirt roads unless you're doing really gnarly bumpy stuff. Sportier riding at the weekend, yeah, it does feel pretty good. There's no adjustability on the front forks, unfortunately, at the rear you only have preload adjustment and there's no remote preload adjuster, it's all via the C-spanner. So let's talk about what it's like for a pillion on the back. Sophie said the seat was fairly comfortable up to about an hour. Um, after that she said her bum did get a little bit numb. For me, I upped the preload all the way to the top with the C-spanner and the bike handled very, very well. Even at low speed, you didn't get that front uh, sort of floatiness that you get when the rear compresses too much. And in the bends and touring, it's absolutely fine with the pillion. It'll be interesting to see what it's like with pillion and luggage. It might start to struggle at that point. And it would have been nice to have a remote preload adjuster just so you don't have to get any tools out. Electronics, let's talk about that. We've got five main riding modes. You've got rain, standard, sport, gravel mode, which is unique to this bike, and also a user configurable mode. You've got switchable uh, items such as power, engine braking, traction control and wheelie control built into the traction control and then you've got ABS, you've got three, tests, three settings for ABS in the user mode, you've also got the gravel mode ABS which limits the amount of rear slip but it doesn't turn it off completely, now I have tested that on a, a gravel road and it just, it makes it less, sort of less effective or more effective for off-road riding, let's say that, um, but you know if you really want to do skids and have full control then just turn the ABS off completely but it's good to see that that's an option. The riding modes all do feel fairly different and they all do offer slightly different levels of ABS and traction control built into each of those riding modes. It's also got a really good turning circle. I think it's like 42, 42 degrees. It doesn't come with a 12 volt adapter as far as I can tell as standard, which is a bit of a shame. It would have been nice to have one of those as standard, but there you go. It is a cheapish, cheap-ish middleweight adventure touring motorcycle. So I guess you can't have it all. The dash is lovely, really nice and clear. You've got a few different uh, themes, but I really like this one with the bar. I think it looks quite nifty. Quickly go through the, uh, the dash. So you press the mode button on the left here to change riding mode. So you've got user, sport, standard, and rain. And you'll see the different circles there. So you've got power, uh, engine braking and traction and at the bottom you've got the ABS so if you go into gravel mode it halves the power full engine braking almost full traction and then the ABS is in the off-road setting if you go into user hold down the mode button you can then move the little joystick as you can see 
you can change things you can set the power so I'm going to set the power for full full engine braking the least amount of traction but you can also if you press up or down on the ABS in user mode you can change it to off-road or on-road if you hold the up button he says it will actually turn off the ABS entirely well we'll test it in a second right let's just do a quick walk around so yes this is the uh, matte iridium grey metallic and it's quite nice 850 mil seat you've got a low option 820 mil if you want you can get a quick shifter which is about two i think it's 240 pounds uh, it's got a six speed gearbox you've got a slip and assist clutch as well so nice you know really really light clutch hondas are pretty good for that uh, chain drive of course led lighting all around self-cancelling indicators got a nice uh, nice nice tone from that exhaust got flies all around me yeah, there's that massive 21 inch front wheel and the relatively small looking 310 mil discs, wavy discs. There's your axial, Nissan axial brakes, big old radiator. This has got a radiator guard on it. And there's the massive 200 mil travel shower suspension. I like the side silhouette of this bike, but like I said, I just think they could have done something better with the light. I think it's just two CB500 XE and it would have been nice to have a toolless adjustable screen, but here we are. <laughs> Obviously, this is going up against the Suzuki V-Strom 800 DE. Now, I have done a first ride on that. There are a few things that that bike has that's better than this, like the remote preloader, fully adjustable suspension front and rear, the quick shifter as standard. It is more expensive. The engines are slightly different. They are the same parallel twin 270 degree clank, crank, clank, but they do make power, to me at least, a little bit differently. Uh, this does not have a bolt-on subframe either, unfortunately. So if you do damage the rear subframe, the bike is a write-off, sadly. Yeah, so okay, ABS is completely off now, so that's good for the off-road bits and pieces. So you can back it in and be an absolute legend. <laughs> Turn the ABS road, road ABS back on. Low hand, low speed manoeuvres. What can we do? At low RPMs, seven miles an hour. It is a little bit jerky, and that once you come off the throttle and then back on it, it's quite easy to get it sort of upset. You do have to be ever so, ever so gentle with the throttle, but I guess you will learn that about the bike over time. I've been on the bike for a little while and bum is not too bad. Did a hell of a lot of uh, hours on the bike yesterday, did about five hours, I think. So I am still a little bit sore from yesterday's action with my mate Ed. Ed ruined my bottom. Right, so I think now we'll go and do a little bit of uh, green laning, shall we? So join me in a second where we will be ready to rock and roll on some green lanes. Right, okay, so we are by the little green lane that's near me. I'm going to stick it in gravel mode first of all, which has the standard off-road mode. Let's get going and up on the pegs. Let's see what the rear does when we... So it, yeah, okay, so it kind of modulates the braking a little bit. We've also got traction control. So let's turn off traction control if we can. Let me do that in this mode. No, we can't, okay. So we're gonna have to go over to user mode, hold that down, go over to traction. I want to turn that off fully. Traction is now off and we are good to go for off-road. So this is the user mode, just so you can see what I've done. I've put power down to two, full engine braking, no traction and the ABS to the rear turned off, as you can see by traction, ABS. So we're not gonna go Banzai crazy because this bike has got to go back to Honda today. <laughs> so what is it like up on the pegs? Let me just dodge this branch. Yeah, it's not bad actually. Um, the bars are not as high as I would like, but you might be able to rotate them a little bit actually. As a changing gear is not too bad either. Suspension actually quite plush for this sort of stuff it's obviously not uh, particularly gnarly but still it's all right <laughs> you can get the rear to spin up if you want i'm getting twanged by bugs so i'm gonna put my visor down and we'll but for this sort of stuff not bad pretty decent actually performance Suspension, really lovely. This is a, this is the one I get wrong all the time. So I'm gonna go this way actually. Just over that side. The 
let's see if we can make the bike skid. Yes, we can. Oh, those are big old divots. But the suspension soaking it up quite nicely. Now, obviously, I'm not, I'm not an expert at this sort of stuff, but it doesn't mean I don't enjoy doing it. But you do have to also be very wary of other other people because it's a byway so you've got cyclists you've got pedestrians yeah this is this is quite fun so i'm in second gear at the moment and i think actually that's a really good gear to be in because you're in, you're not screaming the engine and there's actually enough torque 75 newton meters yeah there's enough torque to do what you need to do for this sort of green laney sort of stuff anyway but yes Ugh. the pegs are I think they've got rubber inserts but I think you can take those out or get you could just get off-road pegs Oof. Boom. yeah see that suspension just dealing with things quite nicely Woo! <laughs> yeah it's fun Ugh, gosh gosh Yeah, that suspension is lovely and soft for this sort of thing. Good amount of travel. Oh dear. Ow. <laughs> yeah, this is a fantastic bike. A fantastic do-it-all machine. Right, let's change it over to sport. So yeah, the uh, Honda Transalp Let's talk about some pros and some cons. So let's talk about the cons first. So it doesn't have a remote preload adjuster, which is a bit of a shame. It would be nice to have that. It's so easy to uh, then change the preload if you get pillion and luggage. You've got tubed tires. I know that's gonna upset some people. Whether or not you think that's an issue, it's probably down to personal experience and personal preference. I don't particularly like the idea of tube tires, but I don't have that much experience with them to say whether or not they're a good or bad thing on the road. I would have liked an adjustable screen. No cruise control, I think that's a bit of a misstep. It would be nice to have that even if you have to pay for it as an option, but you just can't get, get it at all. Pros for this bike, the engine is really, really fun. The chassis, very dynamic, very playful. Really likes you to throw it into a bend and <laughs> Honda build quality of course it's pretty decent considering the price considering this bike has to kind of do a bit of everything I think they've hit the nail on the head with how good the suspension is out of the crate without having to touch anything it does work pretty well at doing what it sets out to do I think personally We've got plenty of electronics the ABS is quite nice that so you can switch it off completely at the rear and also turn off traction control as well if you wanted to <laughs> it's just a very fun bike to ride does it beat the Vistra 800 DE? I need to ride that bike a bit more. I've only ridden it for about two hours and I've had this for, for about a week. So I do need to ride the Vistra 800 DE more. This also competes against stuff like the Yamaha Tenere T7, which I've not ridden at all. So I need to get out on that. But at the price it sits at for nine and a half thousand pounds, I think it's a damn, damn good bike. For the money. <laughs> right, I think that will just about cover it from me. There will be more Transalp content coming at some point in the future. I would like to get this for a little bit longer than a week, so do keep an eye on the channel for that. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you do go out today, do ride safely, but remember to have fun, of course, otherwise, what's the point? And until next time, you take care and peace. <laughs>